So hi everyone. Um, today I shall uh, talk a little bit about uh, these terms: <coughs> monophyly, paraphyly, and polyphyly. Um, these terms are very often uh, used to uh, uh, to to describe the discordance between molecular systematics and morphology-based classification. Um, but there is a lot of confusion um, regarding these terms, particularly paraphyly and polyphyly. So let's see, you know, what uh, we'll, we can learn about these terms today. Um, sorry about that. Uh, the slides were not changing. Okay, let us start with the, the term monophyly. Um, now, to understand this term, let us uh, think of, uh, let's come up, come up with an hypothetical example. Uh, let's say there are two genera, genus A and genus B. Uh, genus A has three species, A1, A2 and A3. Uh, genus B has two species, B1 and B2. Uh, and these genera were uh, identified based on, you know, traditional morphological characters, so this was basically the name taxonomy. Now, if you think about it, uh, we would then expect all these three species to be more closely related to each other and these two to be related, more closely related to each other, right? Uh, so basically, monophyly is a condition where a species assigned to a taxa, in this case a genus, uh, cluster together in the molecular phylogeny. Okay, um, of course one can derive a phylogeny using morphological data also, but let's just say that you know we are just going to use molecular phylogeny. So it's a comparison. What we are trying to do here is a comparison between traditional taxonomy and molecular phylogeny, molecular systematics. Uh, do they both agree with each other or not? So when you have monophyly, they do agree with each other, right? So, um, you build the phylogeny of all these species and the phylogeny looks like this, right? So, you use some uh, genetic marker, some gene, and you come up with the phylogeny and the phylogeny looks like this, uh, where species A1, A2 and A3 cluster together and species B1 and B2 also cluster together. So, the phylogeny agrees with the traditional taxonomy and we say that indeed uh, genus A is monophyletic, genus B is also monophyletic, right? Uh, in cladistic definition, and by cladistics I mean, you know, uh, cladistics is one of the, the schools of systematics, the other one being phonetic uh, school uh, and of course there is also evolutionary systematics but let's not get into the uh, the, the details here, um, but what is uh, important for us is to understand how cladists define a monophyletic uh, group or monophyly. So according to cladists, a monophyletic group is a group of species descendant from a single species, a single stem and includes the stem, the ancestral species and all species descendant from it, right? Of course, if you know, you have an ancestral species and all the species that descend from them, they will obviously cluster together. This seems like a very obvious sort of uh, 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 definition. Uh, another way of looking at it is it's a group consisting of ancestor and all its descendants. Um, so that is the, the cladistic definition of monophyly, uh, but in very simple terms, if you have a bunch of species that you have assigned to a particular genus uh, or a bunch of genera you have assigned to a particular family, what have you, when you build a phylogeny, do they all cluster together, right? Uh, but what does it mean in terms of cladistics? Uh, well, it, it, it really means that the character used to describe that taxa or that group 
was inherited from the most recent common ancestor of all the species in that group. Right? Now, genus A was described based on character small a. Right? So many of the genus names, family names, actually pertains to the character that have been used to uh, uh, circumscribe that group. Right? So in this case, there is some character small a that is present in all these individuals. Therefore, they have been assigned to the genus capital A. Right? So the character small a is present in these three species but absent elsewhere. Right. Similarly, genus B has been described based on character B and so on. <clears throat> um, so, what this really means uh, is that uh, uh, this particular character, small a, which is absent in all the other species, 0 means absent, 1 means present, was acquired on the lineage leading to the common ancestor of species A1, A2, and A3. And it has been used to define this particular genus. Um, and uh, uh, we call this an epomorphy or derived character because this character was derived from the absence of that character in the common ancestor of A and B. Uh, from it was derived from 0 to 1 right um, and synapomorphy is another term used in, in uh, cladistics is shared derived characters it's a character derived character that is shared by a bunch of species right so in cladistics or in phylogenetic systematics one uses synapomorphies to identi identify natural groups uh, so basically, we are trying to identify a monophyletic group, single origin of the character used to define that group. So character A is used to define this group. So the common ancestor of uh, all these species um, had that character and it was inherited by the species descending, uh, descending from that node. Uh, so genus A would then encompass all these species including the common ancestor. Right. All right, so let's look at some examples of monophyly um, where groups that were defined based on morphological characters actually turn out to cluster together uh, in the phylogeny. <clears throat> um, there are many examples of that. Um, one that comes to mind is uh, the, the seed plants. Um, these are plants that have seeds as opposed to say ferns and lichens and other plants that do not have seeds. Uh, the seed plants are, are classified into angiosperms and, and gymnosperms. <clears throat> so angios, angiosperms are the flowering uh, plants, you know, they have flowers, they have fruits with uh, that cover the seed. <clears throat> uh, uh, and gymnosperms consist of uh, species like conifers, cycads, pines. Uh, they, uh, the literal translation is naked seed because it's not covered with the fruit. They do not have flowers. And if you look at the phylogeny, the molecular phylogeny, angiosperms are monophyletic. Monophyletic. They cluster together. So are the gymnosperms. So, you know, these are based on different markers. This is one of the earliest papers that actually showed that these groups were, groups were indeed monophyletic. <clears throat> uh, there are numerous such examples. For example, the genus Hemidactylus. It's, uh, it's a gecko, uh, a lizard. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it has, you know, circumtropical distribution. And it is... Uh, the genus is uh, is characterized by you know divided lamellae. Uh, so these little stripes here are something called lamellae, and they are divided. In case of hemidactylus, so hemi is half, dactylus is, is something to do with the foot, um, the toes. <coughs> so you know that's why they are called hemidactylus. And in fact, the molecular phylogeny shows that they are indeed monophyletic. 
Uh, in fact, in the past, there was another genus called Dravidogecko that was subsumed into Hemidactylus. Um, you know, there was some confusion regarding, you know, what characters to use um, to, to circumscribe these groups. But, you know, molecular phylogeny in fact shows that they are uh, two separate groups. So, Hemidactylus is monophyletic, Dravidogecko, which now actually consists of multiple species is also monophyletic but up here if you look at this part of the phylogeny you see that you have genus Gecoella which is nested within Certodactylus right so there, there are some places some phylogenies where you know monophyly is not supported and we'll come to that in a minute um, if you look at the the tetrapod phylogeny, something interesting we observe, uh, amphibians are monophyletic, you know, you know amphibians are, uh, uh, have a biphasic uh, uh, life history, you know, so the, 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 you have a larval stage and an adult stage, the, the larval stage is in the water, adults in the, in, in the, uh, on land and so on. Uh, you have mammals uh, and, and, and everything that's been assigned to amphibians is indeed monophyletic in the phylogeny. Similarly, mammals all possess mammary glands and in the phylogeny they are monophyletic. However, if you look at reptiles, you know, order bacteria, uh, these are creatures with scales, turns out they are not monophyletic. Right. Birds are nested within reptiles, uh, and this is an uh, interesting situation uh, we call uh, paraphyly. But paraphyly can be explained best using the human ape phylogeny. <clears throat> and I'll uh, let you sort of uh, look at this phylogeny for a bit. Uh, what you see here is uh, uh, humans and and uh, uh, the four uh, major lineages of apes. The question is, is this the right phylogeny? In this phylogeny, the humans are sister to the apes. So the apes are monophyletic and humans are sister to it. Right? So this was thought to be the right phylogeny for the longest time. You know, we humans are very distinct from the apes. We are assigned to a different family. And, and, and so on. <clears throat> but when people build the phylogeny, something interesting emerged and that was humans were nested within apes, the so-called apes. So the apes are not monophyletic. Okay. Uh, so what we are calling apes are actually paraphyletic. So a paraphyletic group consists of a common ancestor and some but not all of its descendants. So these are the apes, right? So the common ancestor is out here of all these species. But when we are saying apes, we are not including humans. So, you know, apes are paraphyletic with respect to humans. Of course, now what has happened is uh, people have revised the, the taxonomy uh, and uh, uh, the term apes actually now includes humans um, and, and, and all of them are subsumed into the family uh, hominoidae, right? Uh, so this whole group is now monophyletic with humans being part of this larger radiation, right? Which it, it was always the case, but traditional taxonomy did not reflect it. Um, <clears throat> so what's really happened here? Again, going back to the character matrix, you know, here are the apes, gibbon, orangutan, gorilla, and chimpanzee, and then you have the humans, which now are, of course, part of uh, the ape radiation. Uh, in the past, it was not. Uh, and if you look at a whole bunch of characters, uh, you notice that humans have acquired many unique characters, many apomorphies, and there have been loss of many of these characters, right? So on, on the lineage leading to humans, there have been loss of many 
characters. Uh, the most obvious thing that comes to mind is body hair. If you look at these animals, they are all you know they have a lot of body hair, but humans don't has have as much. Additionally, humans have acquired certain unique characters. So this would be an apomorphy, a derived character from zero to one. Uh, so the overall similarity that we see among the apes, you know, the traditional term apes, uh, is because of shared ancestral characters that have been lost on the lineage leading to humans. And these are called simpliciomorphies. Right? Remember, in case of uh, phylogenetic systematics, cladistics, we are interested in synapomorphies. <clears throat> she had derived characters, characters that were inherited from the immediate common ancestor. In this case, uh, the immediate common ancestor of all these species is this uh, node here. Uh, these characters have been inherited by most of them, but not by humans. Right? Uh, and the similarity that you observe among <clears throat> what was traditionally called uh, uh, apes is, uh, is because of shared ancestral characters that were lost on the human lineage or because human lineage acquired certain unique characters thereby making these groups look more similar and humans look very unique. <clears throat> Um, so let me uh, go over some examples of uh, paraphyly. Um, here's uh, uh, a unique agamid, a ground-dwelling agamid that you see in Gujarat um, and probably parts of uh, Rajasthan. Um, and then you have this other, you know, group of agamids called calotus. Uh, and by the way, this one was in the past assigned to the genus Brachysaura, right? And then you have this common species of garden lizard that's assigned to the genus Calotus. There are many, many species of Calotus. So Bacchusura is this thing from Calotus, uh, but when you when we build the phylogeny, this is work done by Deepak, a uh, postdoc in my lab. When you build the phylogeny, you realize that uh, Bacchusura minor out here is nested within Calotus, right? So what's really happened here is the lineage leading to Brachiosaura uh, has acquired some unique characters, has lost some Calotus characters and you know, traditional taxonomy has therefore put it in a completely different genus, but it's actually phylogenetically falling within Calotus. So it's basically a Calotus. So we subsumed it into Calotus. <clears throat> um, and uh, much of the calotus species that you see are arboreal, at least semi-arboreal, but Brachysora is exclusively terrestrial, ground dwelling, right? So obviously when you have one particular lineage adapting to a different lifestyle, it is going to acquire some unique characters, making it very different. And traditional, morpholo uh, traditional morphology based taxonomy won't be able to, you know, uh, uh, distinguish uh, won't be able to determine the evolutionary relationship between species just based on morphology because you know this particular lineage looks very different from Calotus so it's they're going to place it independent separate from Calotus. Uh, <clears throat> so here's another paper which found something else quite interesting. Turns out it's not just Brachysora that is nested within Calotus <clears throat> There's another species called uh, Samophilus, um, the genus Samophilus, that is assigned to genus Samophilus, that turned out to be nested within Calotus. So this whole thing is the Calotus radiation. And uh, within the Calotus radiation, you of course have Bacchisora nested within Calotus, you have Samophilus also nested within Calotus. Now, Samophilus are rock dwelling, right? Um, whereas much of the uh, Calotus radiation species are arboreal. <clears throat> uh, so clearly this is also Calotus. Um, however, in this paper, what they have basically done is erected multiple new genera 
um, because the evolutionary relationship does not reflect uh, the morphology, so they wanted to retain Cymophilus. But if you want to retain Cymophilus as a distinct species, then what do you do about these other species of Calatus? So they have uh, uh, erected two new genera, uh, Monilisaurus uh, and uh, uh, Microaureus, right? Uh, these were calotus in the past, uh, so this was done to make phylogeny consistent with, with the taxonomy. Now this is problematic because if you go back to, to Brachiosaura, if we want to retain Brachiosaura as a, as a distinct genus, then we would have to assign this particular calotus to a different genus and also this one to a different genus and all of these and this lineage to a different genus and so on, right? Uh, <clears throat> uh, so when you have paraphyly, so in this case, both Cymophilus and, and, and Brachiosaura, uh, in this case, the uh, Calotus is paraphyletic uh, because these two different genera are nested within uh, uh, Calotus. So ideally, we should subsume these two species, in, uh, these two lineages into Calotus to make Calotus monophyletic, right? So that, that would be the right approach. Okay, now paraphyly is very common. <clears throat> and uh, here's another study uh, where uh, if you look at Blackpuck uh, genus Antelope, is nested within Gazella, right? Uh, so basically it's gazella, uh, but morphologically it's different, there are many characters that separate uh, antelope from the gazelles and therefore it was thought to be a different genus. If you look at uh, genus Gekoella, uh, it is nested within a genus called Certodactylus. Um, and what these authors did was they subsumed Gekoella into Certodactylus uh, but in brackets said uh, mentioned that it's subgenus Gecoella. So they do recognize the fact that Gecoella is distinct from Certodactylus, but it is nested within Certodactylus. So this might be a solution to uh, solution to the discordance between uh, morphology-based taxonomy and phylogeny um, and. Uh, so that there's good uh, uh, concordance between the two. Now, Gecoella is exclusively ground dwelling, whereas Certodactylus are stensorial. They, they dwell on vertical surfaces, right? So that is where, um, um, uh, actually it turns out, paraphyly is very common. You know, there are many other examples. Uh, Gecoella, as I said, uh, is one such example. Gecoella is exclusively found in peninsular India and in Sri Lanka and Certodactylus in northern India into southeast Asia. Um, uh, so Gecoella would now be called Certodactylus in bracket, which is subgenus Gecoella, you know, and so on. Uh, and it turns out uh, paraphyly is very common. Uh, for example, lizards and snakes, if you look at the phylogeny, uh, these are called squamates, uh, snakes are actually nested within lizards. Similarly, butterflies are nested within moths, right? Uh, so in this case, what basically we have to do is subsume the offending uh, taxa into um, the, the the larger group in which it is nested, right? So that gazella now becomes monophyletic, and maybe assign it, assign this offending taxa uh, to a subgenus. So this would then be gazella in bracket subgenus antelope, right? So that's I think a, a, a fairly reasonable solution. Now the other term often used is, is polyphyly, okay? Um, now if you look at, look at this image, you have vultures from the New World, uh, from North and South America, and these are, you know, this is a typical vulture from the Old World, Africa and Asia, 
and of course these were assigned to the same family for the longest time they look the same you know they share so many characters they both feed on on carrion dead animals they both have uh, uh, morphological and physiological adaptations for carrion feeding they both also soar um, uh, use wind thermals to to glide uh, so there's so many characters they share now it turns out when people looked at the phylogeny that the new world vultures and old world vultures are not sister they are completely unrelated right the old world vultures are related to the birds of prey to the raptors but the new world vultures are actually related to the storks by the way there are certain carrion feeding storks also right so this is a classic case of convergence uh, the new world world the old world vultures never made it to the new world and the lineage of storks in the new world then you know occupied that niche right so it's convergence so the new world vultures and old world vultures are not related to each other at all so we call this polyphyly and this is because of convergence uh, technical term in cladistics is homoplasy for convergence now a polyphyletic group basically is a group with two or more ancestors right so monophyly is one ancestor mono one phyly is uh, branch or ancestor but in this case this vulture group the ancestor is over here and this one has ancestor here uh, so it's polyphyly uh, so it's uh, two or more or multiple ancestors but not including the true common ancestor of its members right so when you say vultures uh, you know you're talking about this lineage and this lineage but it does not include this common ancestor so it just includes that and that <clears throat> okay so what's happened here it's convergence this independent acquisition of the same character in the new world vulture and the old world vultures right um, and we call this convergence uh, independent acquisition of the same characters in unrelated species uh, so in this case we need to revise the taxonomy right so clearly new world vultures and old world vultures cannot be assigned to the same family right so this is just a character matrix a bunch of characters the same set of characters are found in new world vultures and old world vultures making them quite similar morphologically okay uh, so here's a, an example of, uh, of langurs from India where we see a similar kind of conflict. Um, there's a whole bunch of species of uh, langurs found in India and most of them are placed in the genus Trachypithecus and there's Hanuman langur, you know, the common widely distributed species placed in genus Semnopithecus. Um, and this is just uh, the distribution of these species. Hanuman langur is found all over India and in Sri Lanka. And then you have Trachypithecus throughout Southeast Asia as well as in Southwest India and Sri Lanka, Southwest Sri Lanka. Right? Uh, Nilgiri langur and purple faced langur are in Trachypithecus. Now, when we look at the molecular phylogeny, uh, it turns out, you know. Uh, these are the Southeast Asian Trachypithecus, right? And here is Hanuman Langur, Antelus. Uh, and these are the two Indian Trachypithecus. They are branching with, with Semnopithecus, right? Uh, so here is a better figure. So uh, Purple Face Langur and Nigri Langur were thought to be part of. Uh, this group here, Trachypithecus, uh, but turns out they are closely related to Hanuman Langur, which is in the genus Semnopithecus. So, clearly, there's independent acquisition of the same character in unrelated species. And how has that happened? Well, uh, Nilgiri Langur and Purple Face Langur uh, are found in, in evergreen forests uh, in southwest India and Sri Lanka. And many of the leaf monkeys in Southeast Asia also are found in evergreen forests so what this has 
resulted in is acquisition of similar morphological characters in these unrelated lineages um, and this is really convergence so it's polyphyly uh, and of course then we have to in this case we have to revise the taxonomy we now place purple face langur and nilgiri langur in the genus semnopithecus and trachypithecus goes to the, the genus name is assigned to the southeast asian langurs uh, a similar situation with this amazing frog uh, genus philotus uh, these are really tiny frogs um, uh, they exhibit something called direct development you know so, so you go from egg to an adult directly uh, there is no intermediate uh, tadpole stage uh, and there are about 150 species in, in, in Asia in India, Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia um, but when you look at the phylogeny of, uh, of uh, Racophorus uh, of, of um, subfamily Racophoridae you realize that what we are calling Philotus is all over the place right so clearly this is again independent acquisition of the same character along different lineage so the taxonomy has to be revised Philotus the genus name is now confined to the population found in Sunda shelf um, that is Indonesia um, you know Borneo and Philippines those set of islands um, the ones in India is now assigned to a different genus all these other lineages have been subsumed into the, the, the genus in which they are nested in right so this is again a case of, uh, of convergence um, <clears throat> at this point I would like to introduce another uh, interesting group that we worked on um, uh, a plant example Seropegia in case of Seropegia, what we see is something quite interesting. Uh, there are two flower kinds uh, uh, so, uh, in the larger group. Uh, so the genus Seropegia looks something like this, where you know the the, the structures on top uh, are all together like that, and there's another related group where you know these things open up, right? So it's an open flower. This is a closed flower. So genus Seropegia is closed, Brachistelma is open, right? But when we when you build the phylogeny, you re realize that you know genus Brachistelma is actually nested within Seropegia, right? And Seropegia is also found in Africa. You see a similar situation. You have open flower as well as closed flower, and Brachistelma is is nested within within uh, Seropegia. So clearly Seropegia is paraphyletic because Brachistelma is nested within um, Seropegia and Brachistelma needs to be subsumed into Seropegia all of this is Seropegia um, but there's an interesting sort of a side story here right if you look at uh, the Calotus story here uh, a simplifies phylo phylogeny uh, you have many species of Calotus uh, uh, However, with, when we look at the phylogeny of Calotus, you have Brachysaura, the ground-dwelling agamid, which is nested within Calotus, and you have Samophilus, the rock-dwelling agamid, which is also nested within Calotus. So clearly, Calotus is, is paraphyletic, right? Similarly, in the case of Seropegia, you have uh, the open flowers, genus Seropegia, and within that, you have the close, uh, I'm sorry, the Seropegia is the, the, the close flower, whereas uh, Brachistelma are the open flowers uh, which are nested within Seropegia. So, Seropegia is polyphyletic, uh, I'm sorry, is, is, is paraphyletic, where Brachistelma nested within uh, Seropegia. However, what you see here is interesting because you have multiple origin of, of Brachistelma within Seropegia. So, in a way, it's also convergence. So, is this polyphyly? No, it's not polyphyly. It is still paraphyly because this is a special kind of, 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 uh, of uh, convergence called parallel evolution, right? Where the same uh, 
character is acquired by unrelated taxa from this from similar ancestral state so the ancestral node all over here would be closed flower cerapegia like because that's the most parsimonious uh, solution um, whereas in case of in case of polyphyly right you have independent acquisition of the same character from different ancestral state Okay, so that's how one can distinguish the two. So here's an example of, of polyphyly where there's, you know, these two species have been assigned to the same genus, independent acquisition of the same character from a different ancestral state. The ancestral state here and here are different because the sister genus uh, here are different. Right? Whereas in this case, you have the same sister genus. Right. So this is a special case of, of, of convergence called parallel evolution, uh, but it is still, uh, even though it is convergence, uh, we don't call it polyphyly because um, it is acquisition of the same character uh, from uh, the similar ancestral state, whereas in case of polyphyly is acquisition of the same character from different ancestral states. Right. Um, so I just wanted to sort of contrast the two. Okay, so to wrap it up, we talked about three different uh, scenarios here, uh, all of which uh, uh, these terms are used to better understand uh, or to better describe uh, concordance or discordance between molecular systematics and uh, traditional taxonomy uh, ideally this is what we want to see whatever we describe based on a particular morphological character are monophyletic they branch together they cluster together in a phylogeny uh, often we find something like this where there are some species uh, that are not part of that group because they have acquired some unique characters so here we subsume this species into this uh, group uh, so that it is monophyletic just like here and you know some people have uh, suggested that you know because this particular lineage has acquired certain unique characters let's retain the genus name but call it subgenus right and then you have polyphyly where there's independent acquisition of the same character by unrelated species Right, and uh, so this is because of convergence, right? And in this case, uh, one of them have to be assigned to a different genus. So we have to revise the uh, the taxonomy. In both of these cases, we have to revise the taxonomy. Here, this genus is subsumed. In this case, a new genus has to be erected. Either A one has to be assigned to a different genus, or A two, right? And Polyphyly is different from this particular case here, uh, where you know the same character has been uh, acquired from this, the same ancestral state, but here the same character has been acquired from a different ancestral state, because you know B1 probably had uh, so basically the ancestor here had a very different character state than the ancestor here, right? So I hope uh, this was useful uh, because there's a lot of confusion in the literature out there. Uh, people often confuse between paraphyly and polyphyly and I hope this uh, talk has, has clarified it. Uh, monophyly, of course, there's no confusion. Um, but I think these are important terms that help us uh, better understand uh, how characters uh, uh, have evolved in different groups. Um, so I'll keep you guys posted with more such talks.